to improve the utility of scientific information and how to link that science with decision making. Um, the call for useful and usable science uh, has uh, emerged in uh, National Research Council reports, calls from uh, science academies from around the world, uh, U.S. Congress, etc. And while we don't really have a clean and perfect definition of what constitutes usable science, as Lisa Dilling uh, pointed out uh, with Maria Carmen Lemos in a paper not too, too long ago, um, we know that in general, usable science helps uh, expand alternatives for decision makers, um, contributes to the decision making process more directly, um, and tends to improve policy outcomes. Uh, that said, doing usable science, uh, creating usable science has consequences. Part of that means reshaping the policies for scientific research. Uh, part of that means uh, developing new approaches to research itself. Um, and another part of it involves uh, reshaping the social contract with science. Uh, and there have been positive results. Uh, we have evidence that shows that when we do direct uh, research towards specific societal outcomes, uh, we can improve results and we can uh, both contribute new knowledge to uh, science and our understanding of the world um, and also solve salient problems. But uh, are we fetishizing? the concept of usable science? Um, are there consequences to it, uh, to basic research and to science policies? Um, and so what I'm hoping we can talk about on today's panel is sort of, you know, is there a sweet spot for shaping science policies and research to be more salient, um, but at the same time, um, not limiting uh, the role of, of unfettered research, as Vannevar Bush would describe it, um, in our pursuit of solving problems? So I'm very excited about our panelists today. Um, uh, to my left is Susan Avery. Dr. Avery took office as the ninth president and director of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in 2008. She has a background in atmospheric research uh, and has used her position to underscore the importance of ocean atmosphere terrestrial humanity interactions and understanding Earth as a system. She's personally underscored the importance of advances in ocean observing systems, the future of the ocean in a changing climate, ecosystem approaches to our understanding and management of multiple uses of the ocean, and the need for legal protection of the scientific deliberative process. Since arriving at HUI, she has been working on new business models, diversifying funding, and encouraging interdisciplinary problem-oriented research. She encouraged the institution to become involved in applying fundamental research to the recent ocean crises uh, the Deepwater Horizon blowout, and the Fukushima release of radionuclides in the ocean. Dr. Avery currently serves on numerous national and international committees. I'm just going to name a couple here. Um, one is the U.S. Advisory Committee to the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, um, as well as the NOAA Science Advisory Board. Dr. Avery came to Woods Hole actually from University of Colorado Boulder, so she's familiar with the campus and the culture here. Uh, she was a member of the faculty and served as interim positions as Vice Chancellor for Research, Dean of the Graduate School, as well as Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. Uh, Dr. Avery also served as Director of the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences uh, and was, uh, as we heard from Roger earlier today, uh, played a significant role in creating the Center for Science and Technology Policy Research. Um, her research interests include atmospheric circulation and precipitation and development of new radar techniques and instruments for observing the atmosphere and the role of climate science and decision support. Next, we're going to hear from Shannon McNeely, who received her doctoral degree in environmental change and sustainability science from the University of Alaska Fairbanks in the Interdisciplinary Resilience and Adaptation Program as an NSF IGERT Fellow, and then as an NSF Graduate Research Fellow. Her doctoral research focused on climate variability and change impacts, vulnerabilities, and adaptive capacity of indigenous people in the remote rural interior region of Alaska. She first began working for NCAR in 2000 as an associate scientist before start starting her doctoral degree in 2004. Her work is interdisciplinary and cross-cultural, incorporating the social and natural sciences in order to understand human environment relationships and how people are impacted by and respond to environmental change. She's been involved in climate change education and research for 16 years, most recently as a postdoc fellow at NCAR, and her research focused on water scarcity and sustainability in the context of climate variability and change in the northwest of Colorado. Uh, 
Uh, more recently, she has been a fellow in the School of Natural Resource and Environment at the University of Michigan, where she co-wrote the adaptation chapter of the upcoming U.S. National Climate Assessment and is currently leading research on climate adaptation actions happening across the globe through the Global Environmental Facility financing mechanisms for developing and least developed countries. And then finally, we're going to hear from Dr. Carl Mitchum, who received his PhD in philosophy from Fordham University with a focus on the philosophy of science and technology. He's held teaching appointments uh, across the country, uh, but now uh, is a faculty member at the Colorado School of Mines. He's held supplementary appointments at a number of universities, including the European Graduate School, University of Basque Country. His trajectory of scholarly research has been from the philosophy of technology through applied ethics and science, technology, and society studies to the philosophy of science policy and the theory and practice of interdisciplinarity. Publications over the last decade include the four-volume Encyclopedia of Science, Technology, and Ethics, Humanitarian Engineering, and the Oxford Handbook of Interdisciplinarity. Most recently, he's been a rapporteur on two European Commission expert group reports dealing with the global governance of science and been working with colleagues in China to enhance mutual understandings of challenges facing different intellectual traditions, such as Confucianism, Marx Marxism, and pragmatism, and practices such as peer review and professional engineering ethics. So with that, I would uh, like to turn the uh, discussion over to uh, Dr. Susan Avery. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, well, I'm going to part a little bit from this morning where most of the people just talk, and I do have a PowerPoint presentation, in part to illustrate um, some examples of uh, usable science coming from very, very different perspectives. And um, I think it's, it's useful to, uh, to, to kind of look at this and say, just as a preliminary, preliminary comment, um, you know, if you listen to people out there now, there are many definitions of research we have. We have basic research. We have fundamental research. We have applied research. We have use-inspired research, curiosity-driven research, mission-driven research, discovery research, development research, and now usable research. And you know, I, I guess there's, and there's, there's really passionate debates about these terms, um, passionate debates that only an academic community could engage in. Um, and in reality, we need all of these. We need all of these types of research. This is a spectrum of research. It's a spectrum of research, and it's very, very difficult in my mind to, to, to designate what, where one starts and the other begins. Um, and they all are complementary and feed each other in many ways. And so I hope today some of the examples I give you will show you that usable research could be driven totally from looking at just something that a scientist developed or, or was excited about, very, very sort of serendipitous that it's usable, uh, to those where you actually consciously and deliberatively go through a process in order to solve a particular problem. So, um, you know, one of the things that, in terms of, 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 of where science and where research becomes useful is, is really the, 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 the issues are twofold in my mind. One is who defines and frames the research questions. In other words, how are they defined? Who's involved in that engagement in defining the research questions? And secondly, how is it going to be used? Okay. If, it's not, if, you, if you can have usable science that's not used, mm -hmm. right? And so the real question is, uh, in order to make this really beneficial, is to say, how do you define and frame the research questions, and ultimately, how it's used? So I'm going to try to start one way to try to look at what is sort of uh, going to be useful or usable uh, research, is to take a look at what other people are thinking. Uh, what are some of the real hazards or, criti or crit uh, critics or, or things that people are really worried about? This happens to be uh, a sort of a plot of risks that, are, that, that came out of the World Economic Forum a couple years ago. And basically it shows uh, uh, some of the, the perceived impact in terms of economic losses versus the perceived likelihood to occur, for an event to occur. And it's categorized by economic, environmental, societal, geopolitical, or technology uh, perspectives. And I've just highlighted some of those uh, that are really associated with research in the environmental sciences or the geosciences, where science would have sort of a critical component in, uh, in basically formulating some way that one, to some decision points, that one would address some of these issues. Um, and it's important, I think, also to realize that all of those issues and the demands 
on science have grown significantly. They've grown significantly from the demands that you had in post-World War II for a daily weather forecast. Okay? So the demands for predictive or projective scientific information, evidence-based, well-categorized, well well-formulated, is over a, a stream of things. What are we doing with energy and carbon and, and alternative forces? What are we, what's happening in terms of, what, what do I know in terms of predictions of, of what's going to happen with water? Food availability. We already heard about extreme events or high impact weather events. Air and water quality, fire hazards, human health, urbanization and population migration, poverty and education, national security. You know, there's a, you know, there's a tremendous almost burden that's being put on the scientific enterprise to think about how are we going to collect and do really legitimately high quality scientific research that's, that's evidence-based, hypothesis tested, and that's going to ultimately lead to some sort of product or decision support tool in helping in these a variety of areas. And then I use this little diagram to kind of just sh talk about, well, how do you transition and how, how do you make really usable science or science really work in some of these areas? And this first circle here, it's just the circle of understanding our natural environment and involves a lot of different disciplines. It's a very interdisciplinary field. It involves understanding what the sun is doing, the atmosphere, the land, the ice, the sea for life, the ocean, and how they all interact together. Okay? But if you're really interested in making this usable, you have to understand how that environment interacts with the human environment. And I think recently we're also understanding that the humans are putting a profound impact on the environment. So this is a two-way street. So understanding that intersection between um, what was naturally classified as our natural environment and working in, in connection with our human environment, you uh, encompass sort of disciplines and, and entities that are going to be looking at population pressures, being able to predict increased land and ocean use, water and food demands, energy demands, the fact that po populations might be great, migrating to urban areas, ecosystem resilience, and then, of course, the stressors that humans are putting on the system, pollution, climate change, and, and sort of even geopolitics. And then you have this next sphere of looking at things, and that's developing the information systems that are going to help and plan and manage and decision support areas, whether it's in hazard mitigation, human health, water resources, air quality, you got the list. And then you have this fourth intersecting sphere of really what are these practical actions that are going to actually make, make, make these decision support things really work towards uh, a sustainable planet, enabling legislation, and certainly policy is one of them, economic stimulus might be another strategy, international collaboration certainly, um, and the list goes on. So this is not an easy thing to do, ultimately is what I'm saying. It's not an easy thing to do. So let me illustrate how some use examples of usable science that have come from a very different sort of initial starting point, but they're all examples of usable science. And, and that's why I think universities have to embrace the fact that there is different ways of approaching and doing usable science. So the first one I'm going to talk to you about is basically how do we model and forecast biophysical behavior. And I'm using ocean examples primarily because those are the ones that I, I'm most familiar with now after four and a half years at an uh, oceanographic institution. And besides, it's good for a landlocked institution here to know something about the ocean. Um, and what you see, or what you did see up here, I'll, I'll try to go back and then go forward again. Um, this is basically a harmful algal bloom forecast. Now, harmful algal blooms are blooms that occur in the ocean episodically, usually in the spring and summertime. Uh, they basically bring up uh, toxic uh, chemicals or to toxic um, uh, biological material that is, can be very deadly and fatal to fish. You see massive fish kills, sometimes mammal kills, and they can also uh, negatively impact uh, human health. Now, these occur in the Northeast very well. They also occur in Florida very regularly, and there's an increasing number of harmful algal blooms. It, the result, the need to do a forecast here is to actually be able to forecast when these are and to be able to prepare for them because ultimately it, it results in closing down beaches and water um, front areas. So how do you go about doing this? Well, from a scientific point of view, a scientist realized that, okay, we have these harmful algal blooms. It would be really nice to understand how they evolve and can you actually get to a forecast. So here we're, we're really seeing a scientist who's very, for scientific groups, that's really cognizant of the fact that we have a real problem out here, and we think we can actually tackle this problem. And it took, you know, a good five, six, seven years of really understanding what this, how this problem fits together. 
And this is not just a physical problem, and it points out the problems that you have in dealing with a biological response that is very, very dependent upon what's happening in a physical environment. And so this has been very, very successful. It's been based in a, a research in, uh, for over you know, six, seven years, supported by the National Science Foundation, um, NOAA, and the National Inst Institutes of Health. And recently, that forecast capability and skill set was sufficient enough that it was able to be translated into a test or experimental operational forecast. And so now NOAA offers this uh, uh, experimental, in an experimental form, um, as a forecast. Okay? So, so that's one example of something being stimulated by a scientist, groups of scientists realizing there's a, pro a really interesting problem here that has societal need and we're gonna tackle it. Okay, here's another example. And this is the growth and understanding of, of uh, development of marine protected areas. And the basic question you say is why, what do we want to preserve and why? So there are a number of marine, uh, large, very large marine protected areas out there. I would argue that a lot of them are based, uh, are chosen, not on the basis of any scientific evidence, but on the basis of pure emotion, okay? Um, and a lot of them, of course, don't necessarily have the scientific skill set to actually manage those marine protected areas. We are much like our National Park Service as well. You know, the National Park Service was, was created for this pristine moment in American, uh, preserving a pristine natural moment in, a, in American history um, and American nature, natural environment, of course. It was first looked at as a regulatory function and an enforcement type of function. But in reality, managing your national parks, very much like managing your, man, uh, your marine protected areas, require an awful lot of science and understanding what's going on in these ecological systems. But how do you, how do you this, the ocean's big, you know, it's 70, it covers 70% of the planet. Okay, it's a pretty big place. And trying to understand what's out there, what's the best place to produce, uh, do these protected areas. And so we've had a, a group of uh, scientists here who have been studying uh, coral reefs and, uh, and the growing role or, or, or complex problem in the ocean associated with um, a warming planet. Um, that is uh, how what's happening to the food chain for uh, coral reef systems and associated uh, organisms that, that thrive on, on, on coral reef systems. Um, and uh, of course, the, the issue of ocean acidification. And so, what happened here is uh, getting together with the government of Palau, who was very interested. They, have a, they really wanted to uh, look at their marine protected areas and develop marine protected areas in their um, EEZ. It's a fairly large EEZ, lots of little islands, lots of uh, space around those islands that they can call their EEZ. Um, but the real question is, what coral reefs are out there that are perhaps more resilient to changes that are occurring and might be occurring in the future than others. Because if you could find these biological systems that were basically more resilient, those would probably be the areas which you more preferentially would select as marine protected areas. And so that's what this has been done here. So now you see sort of s some fundamental science that, that grew out, but then a real understanding, a real problem from a policy and governance framework on how am I going to use that to identify what are the most resilient areas to preserve, and then working with that government right from the start, determining how you establish that, uh, that marine protected area and then how you manage it in the future. A third, uh, this, this basically goes to the issue of, of uh, basically a, a usable science in terms of, of just getting information. Um, and uh, we, you know, a lot of uh, uh, science that's environmental science, it, the laboratory is your world. Okay. You have to have measurements in your world. And increasingly, if you want usable science, you have to have lots of different types of measurements of lots of different quantities and, and uh, uh, parameters. And so this whole idea here is, is really, how do you integrate sensors, platforms, networks? And I'm not just talking about physical data. I'm talking about physical data. I'm talking about biological data. I'm talking about economic data. I'm talking about social science, demo demography data. All of this data has to be integrated in ways that um, have sensors, platforms, um, and networks. And I think there's been a, a real sort of change going on here. This is an illustration of, of how to get measurements into the ocean uh, that are 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 360 days a year, very much like the atmosphere the National Weather Service enjoys right now. 
in order to really understand um, what is going on. And these are not just physical state variables of the ocean, but also the biological components as well. So these, this is sort of another sort of transition, if you will, of where the research questions are dictating a whole new set of types of observations that one needs to pull together in order to be usable to a variety of problems. And let me finally end with a fourth, a fourth example of, of, of usable science that was serendipitous in many ways. Um, it is a, you know, how do we respond in environmental crises? This happens to be our particular response to the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, we did a lot of work at any one point in time. The institution probably had 100 scientists, engineers, and crew uh, in the Gulf during this period. Um, of course, the institution fundamentally had a, a strong uh, previous record in studying oil um, in the ocean, particularly natural oil, natural seepage of oil um, in the ocean. Um, but it was really, the, it, it was really, I think, the, the true value of working on this project in the Gulf was understanding how science that was unfettered, was discovery-based, could come to solving and answering some very, very important questions about what was happening in this, in this environment. And so what, uh, what in particular, and you're not going to see this because I, somehow the, the media didn't get associated with this, but this is one measurement of taking, um, basically we had to take a, a sample of oil right from the wellhead. Now that's a pretty difficult problem because you have to take a sample of the oil, you have to put it in a sampler, you have to keep it at pressure when you bring it up to surface, you have to keep it under lock and key, and then you have to very, very carefully crack it open in order to do the chemical analysis. Okay, now this figure here shows exactly a sensor that does that, not for oil, not for an, a gushing oil out of a wellhead, but for hydrothermal vents. Okay, now hydrothermal vents are these large uh, uh, smokers, volcanic, you know, uh, eruptions, uh, uh, that are in the, on the ocean seafloor. They're basically a wonderful discovery, probably the best, one of the highlighted discoveries of the 20th century. Um, they are, are the basis for chemosynthetic life. I can, I can talk about a, an example of chemosynthetic life. But the sampler that was developed was to study hydrothermal vents, fundamental research question. But it was basically used, it was reconfigured a bit, and used in collecting what was probably one of the most important samples for this particular uh, Macondo, uh, for this particular oil spill. So there you see something just, just very serendipitous, the fact that you're, you're building on, you're, you were called into, uh, called into help, and this is what you were able to do with that scientific background, and it points out to the value of having that unfettered scientific background work in order to draw upon in times of crisis. Um, those results, from those, all of the work we did there have been uh, extensively published and they have been extensively used. They've been extensively used in major reports. They're certainly being used in terms of looking how you might change things. They've also been used very much in this legal battle uh, between BP and the Department of Justice, um, which of course has led me into, uh, unwillingly uh, perhaps, but uh, importantly, uh, looking at how do you protect the deliberative scientific process because this is a, an issue in which you're drawing upon research entities to, uh, to work in, a, in a, an environment. Um, we have a, usually academic research has uh, capabilities to respond in these things, the independence, the willingness, the diligence, the prudence, the capacity building, all that you want to keep uh, there, but you also want to protect the scientific deliberative process along the way. I will end with what do I think research entities, and I mean academic institutions, I mean independent research organizations, I mean uh, fundamental uh, or uh, science agencies that fund science, what you need to do to enable usable science. And, and you should probably guess by now that, that you really, the problems, the examples that I showed here across, have, are basically across a number of the sort of traditional research uh, paradigms that we talk about. Uh, and one thing, of course, is to, uh, to address the reward system and acknowledge that there's a spectrum of research. Um, don't always look at tenure time for the, the home run hit. Look for a better, for a more diverse portfolio. Develop support functions to enhance high quality usable science research. Uh, the life sciences in particular has a very, very nice uh, mechanism of translating its discovery and research into application, uh, the sort of the bench to bedside 
a culture that's in a, a lot of our life sciences and biomedical sciences, supported by a support group, a tech transfer group. But there could be stakeholder group engagement, informatics infrastructure, all of these things that would help doing that. Finding mechanisms for partners with the private sector, um, advocating for legal practice reform and protecting the deliberative scientific process, communicate and advocate for the value of discovery research, and to recognize the tremendous possibilities with the caveat of perils when advocating a particular action. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. It's, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, I think that's good. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's, a, it's actually an honor and a treat to be part of this event because I first started working at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in 2000 when Roger was still there. So we overlapped by a year or two, I guess. Um, so it's been great to see Roger start this center and everything it's done in the last 10 years. So it's really cool to be part of this. So I'm going to talk about um, the work that I've done, the field work that I've done, and some of the lessons I've learned in terms of <coughs> working in communities and working cross-culturally, which in relation to the culture of science is, includes basically all cultures. <laughs> and in fact, science is in and of itself multicultural. So the work that I do is um, really participatory climate change vulnerability and, and adaptive capacity and adaptation analysis. And it's certainly not the only way to do usable science or any of the dozen or so types of science that Susan mentioned. It's one way and it's a way that I found very effective. I'm, I'm an interdisciplinarian across social, ecological and climate sciences, but my home is really in the social sciences. I, I use ethnographic approaches. Um, I'm interested in cultural issues. So what I'm going to talk about today is my experience working in two very, very different cultures, one with tribes in Alaska and the other um, in Colorado on water resource issues. So I'm just going to go through kind of a list of, as I was thinking through, you know, what are some of the, the key attributes um, from my perspective of usable science. And so I'm going to talk, I'm going to touch on all these things, but not in any particular order. One is understanding the context. Um, when you're doing climate adaptation work, it's really important to understand people's livelihoods and the seasonality of those livelihoods to understand um, how climate and weather come into play. Also, the cultural, economic, and polit political and regulatory context when you're looking at uh, social ecological systems and adaptation from you know, a real systems perspective. It's, it's important to understand the decision-making process. Um, so again, in relation to seasonality and livelihoods, the seasonality of decisions is really important. And also, the power structure and the, the land and resource rights or entitlements that people have to deal with because that's what both structures and either facilitates or constrains adaptability. So the last sort of group I'm gonna be talking about, and this is really what I'm gonna focus on, is, is kind of the research process and building relationships through the research process. One approach that's really important in the work that I do is really integrating local expert knowledge and observations of climate change and weather, for example, with so-called scientific knowledge um, or more conventional scientific knowledge. I personally think that, that good usable science is fundamentally participatory and iterative um, <clears throat> and really engages locals as collaborators and partners in two-way learning. It's actually multi-directional learning, but since we're kind of talking about stakeholders and scientists, not only do um, people have a lot to learn from the science, but scientists and science have a lot to learn from local experts. I want to talk a little bit about the importance of language and communication and ultimately trust. And for me, the type of work that I do, this last part, the trust part, is really fundamentally the most important important piece in terms of making your science something that's relevant, credible, usable to stakeholders. And as I'm sure a lot of you know, there's, there is a real trust crisis with science right now. Um, and I'm sure I don't have to go into that, other people probably will, but 
it's really, really, really important to, to think about if you're working with stakeholders, how to um, gain their trust, to really find you credible. So when I say participatory, I mean participatory. I use ethnic Africa approaches. Um, sorry if this picture is offensive to any vegetarians or vegans in the audience, but this is me and um, one of my tribal mentors, uh, Eliza Jones, out in the bush interior, Alaska, who was a, a mentor for me in a lot of respects, um, understanding the culture, the subsistence livelihoods, but also the language. I actually studied their language um, with her. And the language was really important, not just, not even primarily in Kayakon, which is their, which Kayakon Athabaskan is their, um, their native language, but also how they, how they spoke and thought about climate itself. And actually, when I first started working in this village, it was it was really on the early end of um, the onslaught of scientists going to work in this in this particular region, um, and they didn't even use the words climate change. They talked about changes in weather. So when I was doing interviews with people, I actually never used the word climate change. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to talk about in relation to to what we're doing in this picture is when I first started working in this region, I actually thought I was going to focus on lake drying because from a physical ecological perspective, all the scientific kind of homework I'd done beforehand, like what's going on in this area in terms of climate and some of the trends that are happening, the scientists were really mostly interested in, the scientists that I talked to were mostly interested in lake drying because in the interior of Alaska with the permafrost melt, a lot of the lakes are drying, some are filling, it depends on the depends on the subsurface gradient and all that. But I thought that that was going to be the most important issue. And after years of working closely with these people and doing this kind of really um, on the ground vulnerability analysis, I realized that it was actually the fall moose hunt that was the most important issue for them, both in terms of their vulnerability because it related to their food security, but also in terms of the policy perspective because it had been surfacing in the regulatory context for, at that point I started in 2003, 2004, so for at least three, four years before I even started doing this work. So that was what I ended up honing in on. And, and had I not done that real on the ground participatory work, I, I might not have come to that place. So this is a picture of, a couple pictures of um, a, a midterm sort of uh, report to the villages. And the, to talk about the importance of this iterative aspect and this two-way learning aspect, this is in one of the little villages I worked in, Hughes. And this was me and a couple of my colleagues um, giving some of our initial results in terms of the analysis we had done. We were looking at climate trends and, and ecological trends and, and social trends. And we, we presented this information. And down here, this guy on the bottom right, his name's Travis Cole at that point. He was about a 25-year-old kid. And he and I were talking after the, after the talk, and I was saying to him, you know, I think it would be really great to have kind of a, a visual of, of your seasonal round. I've seen kind of other examples, but I would really like one for this area. And we were having this whole big conversation about how do you communicate across scientific and, and tribal cultures and the way people think about things. So this is the title of my dissertation, and Travis actually went home that night and drew this. And he, he also drew another one, which was funny. It had like charts and graphs, and it was like the scientists, the way they think about it. And he had these little comments like, a bunch of really smart people at UAF, you know, do this. And, but this was really the kind of how do you communicate to the, cult to, the, to the tribes and understand, you know, what's important to them in terms of their seasonality and their livelihoods. So this was their seasonal round. Um, and then he kind of commented around the edges, and I know you guys probably can't see that, but you know, his, his really kind of deep thinking about, about these issues and how you think about climate change in the context of these, of these livelihoods. So I actually hired a graphic designer, and we came up with this image. And one of the things that was also really interesting as I was doing this work was, you know, as scientists, we think about seasons in four, three-month blocks. And that was the way that the, that the trends had really been reported. While working with the Koyakon, I learned that they had a minimum of 11 different names for seasons, and even more if you, if you think about the months, because each month has to do with something that's happening on the landscape and in terms of their livelihoods and their, their harvesting of wild foods and so on. So this was really uh, an important aspect of sort of getting to what ultimately became this integration of the local reality with 
um, local observations of climate change and the analysis that we had done. So this is the final uh, poster for my, for my doctoral work. And you can see, you, you probably can't see great, but <laughs> just imagine, um, the, around the edges is, is l elder observations of, of environmental change alongside of the climate analysis that we did to kind of give a picture of all of these seasonal changes that were happening. And those are all the elders that I interviewed um, in, the, in the circle. So again, this iterative two-way approach to knowledge that, and, and actually as a, as a side note, one of the villages, the village in fact I showed you the pictures from, asked if they could use the, the seasonal round as their, as their tribal logo. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty cool. So then now I'm kind of shifting gears and I'm gonna talk about the work I've done in water resource issues in Colorado and working in a very, very different culture um, a, a much more heterogeneous culture in terms of the communities themselves and the types of interests and ways of, of knowing and understanding and prioritizing information, um, and, and with a lot of climate change skeptics, actually, and, and even some deniers. So in, I actually really like this picture. I, I took this picture from a vantage point of, um, in the Yampa River Basin, there's a Nature Conservancy property that um, is a, also a working farm. And so this actually symbolizes the, you know, I'm standing on a conservation area, the agricultural production of it, and in the background, it's also a, a, a very, very heavy coal producing area. So that's a coal fired power plant. And if you can imagine, way off in the left in the distance is the ski, uh, Steamboat Springs Ski Resort. So you've got this co real combination of agricultural interests, energy interests, conservation interests, and recreation and tourism, all trying to negotiate how to manage water of which climate is a piece. So the decision-making context that this happens in um, is one of the things that I was researching, and this is a picture of the Yampa White Basin's roundtable, and this roundtable process that's been happening in Colorado since about 2005, 2006, is really where a lot of these issues get negotiated um, across these different interests and, and um, perspectives. And one of my favorite stories, when I, when I first started doing this work and I called the chair of this round table and I said, hi, I'm Shannon McNeely, I'm calling from Boulder from the National Center for Atmospheric Research and I really wanna come out and you know, participate and observe the, the round table because I'm, you know, I wanna learn about water issues in the context of climate variability and change. And he said to me, well, that's all fine, but you know, we're pretty big rednecks out here and we're not so sure we buy into this whole climate change thing. And I was like, oh, that's okay. You know, I'm not, I'm not coming to try, I don't have an agenda. I'm coming to observe, I'm coming to learn. I wanna learn from you guys. And so he actually, he and another um, on his staff in the, in the uh, county, in um, Moffat County, the far Northwest County of Colorado w would like coach me, even though they were fundamentally skeptics, they would coach me ahead of meetings and say, now, you know, be careful what you say and how you say it and da da da. And so, so I thought that was really interesting. And you know, in terms of the language, the way that I had to really talk to them, and this will come as no surprise to many of you, Bill and others who've done a lot of water, you know, resource ag issues, is that I talked about long-term climate variability. I talked about drought. I actually even explicitly made the caveat. I know a lot of you have mixed views about climate change. I'm not here to get into the politics. I'm not here to argue with you guys about whether or not climate change is real, whether or not it's human caused. I wanna know how climate affects you. I wanna know how you're vulnerable. I wanna know how you're, how you're responding. And the, the one thing that I said, and I actually said this with the tribes, and I think, it's, I, I think it's the best thing you can say to a group of stakeholders that are of a different culture that you wanna work with, is I'm here to learn from you. And by saying I'm here to learn from you, it completely changes sort of the, the typical power relationship between academic elites or you know, government regulators coming into their communities and saying, you know, we're here to teach you guys all about the science and you need to understand this. It was more, let's learn from each other. Um, so it actually took months of living in the area, um, over a year of attending these basin roundtable meetings that were pretty grueling at times, um, and really building those relationships, building the trust. I did a lot of interviews, I did a lot of participatory observation. And when I gave my final presentation to them, because my postdoc had ended and I had to move on, um, this is just one of the slides, and I don't expect you to be able to read this either, but I, I went through step by step and um, 
reiterated back to them what I had learned from them in terms of during the 2002 drought, which I'm sure most, if not all of you know, was the, you know, the severe to extreme drought throughout the West, um, and particularly in Colorado. What happened here? What, ha where were the points of vulnerability and what was the history of what happened here? And it was actually the first time that anybody had um, given kind of this comprehensive picture of what happened throughout the whole basin. And they really, really responded positively to that. And then I also, you know, using their landscape and their features on the landscape that were important to them, sort of walk through, you know, okay, this is what I learned. Here were the points of vulnerability. Here's some issues that came up. Here, you know, here's how people responded. Here's some of the, um, the adaptations that have happened since the 2002 drought. And it was, it was then and only then that I could actually start to talk, frankly, about climate change and the climate science. And I actually said to them, you know, so here's so here are some of the the, um, the studies about climate science that are happening right now and the different things that they're saying, and they actually really really responded positive positively to that because they trusted me at that point and they knew I didn't have an agenda and I was actually framing it in the context of things that are very important to them, some very 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 big issues that they have coming down the pike like the possibility of um, exploitation of oil shale in the Puyans Basin, like the possibility of another big trans-basin diversion to the Front Range for water needs on the Front Range. So by doing so, it made a room full of skeptics and some deniers, not all skeptics and deniers, but a lot of them, the majority of them, really think twice and say, hmm. And I actually had a friend of mine that I'd made in the area who, who had started out as a climate skeptic when we first met and we became good friends and I turned him into a, a somewhat of a believer. He <laughs> said, you know, I think you really changed some minds in there. I think you moved, moved the dial. And, and again, I know everybody can't do this. It's really hard. It t it, it's not cheap to do this kind of participatory work. It takes grants. It takes a lot of time and effort. But it's one way that usable science can really resonate in across cultures. So just a couple of the take home messages today. Again, uh, understanding the importance of livelihoods and seasonality of actions and decisions in the context in which you're interested if you're doing adaptation assessment. And the importance of participatory iterative approaches, I cannot emphasize enough. And this idea of two way learning, I, I have a big problem with what I see a lot is this framing of producers and users of science and I think it's presumptuous to say it that way because it's kind of this idea if we produce it, they will use it, you know, they will come, they will use it. And, and it's also this idea that it's unidirectional and really it needs to be two way. And ultimately, again, I can't emphasize enough the, the, the critical role building trust with your stakeholders is, plays. Okay, um, like others, I want to acknowledge uh, the great achievements of the Center for Science and Technology Policy Research. Meeting Roger a little over 10 years ago gave me a new perspective on the whole field of uh, policy. We, and policy was something that I had been trying to figure out on my own for at least the previous 10 years. Although I came at the question of policy from a very different perspective, Roger's challenging questions and his insightful work have progressively enhanced my own understanding, and it's been an honor to be associated with CSPPR from its early years. I commend not just Roger, but Bill and Amy and Bobby and everyone else who has helped make the center the success that it, is undou that it undoubtedly is. And through the center, I have had the further pleasure and honor to meet and collaborate with many of the graduate students who studied at the center, gone on to become successes in their own right, and are back here again today. It's a pleasure to meet them again. My special thanks to Betts for inviting me to participate in this particular panel discussion. And now, as Monty Python might say, here's something a little different. <laughs> Let me begin with a story from my days as a parent of teenagers. 
A few years ago, about this time of year, although a couple of months earlier in the calendar, I was taking one of my kids, then in her early teens, to school to register for classes. I was trying to convince her to sign up for some hefty courses in math, science, and a foreign language. Like any dutiful teenage daughter, she had trouble with my recommendations. <laughs> Dad, she said, what's the use of calculus and physics? I'm not going to be a scientist, and I certainly don't need to learn Latin. No one speaks that anymore. Everyone speaks English now. You just want me to take a bunch of hard, useless classes because you had to take them when you were in high school. I don't see why I should take a bunch of stupid, useless classes. <laughs> Some version of that exchange took place at one point or another with all four of my kids. We live in a culture that worships usefulness, and I found it quite difficult to convince them to subordinate their culturally dependent sense of the primacy of utility to some more decentered understanding of the good. In only one out of four cases, for instance, was I able to persuasively invite one of my kids to become fluent in a language other than English, and that learning another language is in some sense a good beyond utility, opening a person to another life world and thereby relativizing the utilities we are likely to inherit as given. The problem I faced with my kids, I continue to face today with my students, not to mention academic administrators, government representatives, corporate leaders, and members of the general public with whom I occasionally come in contact. The let's make everything useful mentality is so prominent in our culture that it is being applied to everything from science to education and art. We want science that is useful, education that gets us a job, and art that's a good investment. This is a special problem in the classroom. Students regularly challenge me about the usefulness of the humanities and the social sciences, especially the study of things like ethical principles, philosophy, and social science theory. What's the value of all this theory, they ask. They want me to make class more useful. They want applied ethics, practical philosophy, and behavioral social science. Teaching at an engineering school, as I do, I have to justify the humanities as necessary to meet ABET criteria, that's the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology, develop communication skills, or enhance meet and greet conversation at an interview. When, on occasion, I challenge students themselves to question their implicit hermeneutics of suspicion with its commitment to the primacy of utility, and do a little work on their own to make their learning useful by opening their minds to new perspectives. I get not only blank stares and eyes redirected to iPods, but sometimes even sarcasm and anger. After all, they tell me, their tuition pays my salary. They are the customers, and the customer is always right. Who am I to tell them that they might need to open their minds to different ways of thinking? Because because I have required students to read not just Plato and Confucius, but also Karl Marx and John Maynard Keynes, along with, let me add, Frederick Hayek and Milton Friedman, but not Ayn Rand, I am easily accused of being excessively European. It has even been implied that I might be lacking in patriotism or trying to corrupt the United States with socialism. Now my guess is that to some serious extent, most of us, whose lives are centered in the, in the university, have been subject to some degree of similar anti-intellectual criticism. The American historian Richard Hostetter, in his influential study of anti-intellectualism in American life, published in 1964, traced its roots to the three great awakenings of religious fervor in the early 1700s, the early 1800s, and again in the late 1800s to early 1900s. He also identified its presence across the board in almost all aspects of American culture, from religion and politics to art and science. But in his opening 12 exhibits of anti-intellectualism, attitudes towards science play a prominent role. He quotes at length Charles E. Wilson, former head of General Motors and Secretary of Defense under President Eisenhower, 
in an appearance for a sen before a Senate committee responding to a question about research. Wilson complains that, and I quote, it's very difficult to get these scientists to come down to brass tacks and list the projects and what they expect really to get out of them. They would just like to have a pot of money without too much supervision that they could reach into whenever they want. Complaints today about the need to make science more usable often echo Secretary Wilson's concerns. One signature pamphlet of the Center for Science and Technology Policy Research on Usable Science, a handbook for science policy decision makers published 2010, would seem to be one effort to respond to Wilson's concern. In the language of CSTPR, quote, producing usable science requires smart choices about the support for a management of science. According to Hostetter, however, Wilson simply represents an attitude toward science that took serious purchase in American culture during the second great religious awakening, the one that gave rise to Mormonism and Seventh-day Adventism, but was then popularized after the Civil War in the culture of business. As Wilson also said, what is good for General Motors is good for the country. Yet it was during the second great awakening period that another thinker, a European thinker, whom Hofstetter surprisingly mentions only in passing, offered what remains one of the most insightful analyses of the character of American life, including its attitude toward science. Alexis de Tocqueville, writing in the mid-1830s in a chapter of Democracy in America titled, quote, Why the Americans are more addicted to practical than to theoretical science, end quote, grounds the predominance of the practical orientation, the demand for usability, not in religion so much as in democracy. Allow me to quote at some length. According to Tocqueville, equity in democracy begets in man the desire of judging everything for himself. Those who cultivate the sciences in a democratic people are always afraid of losing their way in visionary speculation. They mistrust systems, they adhere closely to facts and study facts with their own senses. Later, because of this, in America, the purely practical part of science is admirably understood and careful attention is paid only to the theoretical portion that is immediately requisite to application. Still later, Tocqueville notes that, quote, men who live in democratic communities seldom indulge in meditation and naturally entertain very little esteem for it. Yet from de Tocqueville's aristocratic French perspective, quote, a desire to utilize knowledge is one thing, the pure desire to know quite another. Although, quote, the democratic principle does not induce men to cultivate science for its own sake, it does enormously increase the number of men who do cultivate it for practical means. What Tocqueville argued in the 1830s certainly seems to be the case today. There are in the United States more scientists than ever before, but there is also exceptional pressure from many quarters for the science they pursue to be practical or useful. When in the pamphlet on usable science, when the pamphlet on usable science argues the need for more science that is of immediate use to decision makers and for usability to permeate sciences of all types and at all levels, the argument would seem to be confirming the vision of science that Tocqueville almost 200 years ago said was going to become the dominant characteristic of American science. The question for Tocqueville, and I would suggest for us, is whether to go with the flow or to seek to modify it. Tocqueville himself argued against simply accepting or reinforcing the characteristic American demand for usability and in favor of its moderation. Let me quote Tocqueville one last time. It's a long, lengthy quote. If those who are called upon to guide the nations of our time clearly discern from afar these new tendencies, which will soon be irresistible, they would understand that, possessing education and freedom, men living in democratic ages 
cannot fail to improve the industrial part of science, and that henceforward all the efforts of the constituted authorities ought to be directed to support the highest branches of learning and to foster the nobler passion for science itself. In the present age, the human mind must be coerced into theoretical studies. It runs of its own accord to practical application. And instead of perpetually referring to it, referring it to the minute examination of secondary effects, it is well to divert it from them sometimes in order to raise it up to the contemplation of primary causes." End quote. In other words, recognition of the flow of history and the character of a culture provides an occasion not simply to accept and promote that flow and to accommodate oneself to it, but in modest ways to try to moderate it for the better. This occasional diversion can take the form of questioning the tyranny of utility, asking those who make such demands to turn around and query themselves, what is so special about utility? To consider ways in which the demand for usability may be coarsening the fabric of our culture, and perhaps in some ways distorting modern science, which is nevertheless inherently usable, provided users do a little work to understand what science really is. My concern is that too quickly seeking to respond to the demand for usability, or what on other occasions has been rhetorically stigmatized as the tyranny of relevance, we may fail to call the culture as a whole to standards of intelligence that could otherwise make democracy a more viable political order. Although democracy assumes that people have the right to make bad and even stupid decisions, as Roger noted this morning, there is no reason simply to accommodate that right. Indeed, to do so may ultimately undermine the viability of democracy. Democracy demands, I think, a level of public intelligence to which science and scientists have an obligation to call the general public. In a previous email exchange with Betts, our moderator, she wrote that, didn't know I was gonna quote you. <laughs> Given the cultural bias toward research unfettered by practical concerns, a la Vannevar Bush, I don't think we are in immediate threat of the tyranny of relevance. When research is called upon to provide information for decision support, I think we should take a critical look at whether our current research structure is serving that end or simply producing more curiosity-driven, unfettered research under the guise of providing information for decision support and to respond to societal needs. But with due respect to Betts and other CSTPR scholars, I question whether there is any significant cultural bias toward research unfettered by practical concerns. In fact, my sense is that the bias is precisely in the opposite direction. I grant some measure of such a bias within science, but not in the culture as a whole. And I doubt its great prominence in science as well. Among my science students, for instance, there is a strong tendency to assess science not just for its practical value, but even as simply a means to getting a good job. Here is a remarkable paradox of science and society in the 21st century. Although we are the wealthiest people in all of human history in the United States, we appear to be dominated by determinations to produce and consume more than we enjoy what we have. Nowhere is this paradox more manifested than in our educational system in which scientific, technical, and professional subjects increasingly dominate and liberal learning is marginalized. The humanities and the arts are studied as no more than decorative adjuncts to the sciences or as enhancements of professional practice and commerce. I fear that when we thus too quickly give way to the demands for usability, we aid and abet turning human affairs away from the higher ideal of reflecting on what it means to be human and striving to live according with higher ways of life. Okay, so questions from the audience? Or comments? <laughs> Roger, what a surprise. Our, 
<laughs> Rotten tomatoes, too. All right, thanks. That was a great panel. I love it. I, I'm going to respond to Carl. <laughs> um, surprise, surprise. <laughs> in, in principle, I agree with you. And if only the world was as you describe it. Um, Dan Sarowitz uh, wrote a piece in Nature earlier this year that I pulled up on this idea of the, the tyranny of, of useful science. Um, and it is more than an academic dispute because people make decisions about budgets and resources and allocations. And uh, what, what Dan writes here is that over the past 15 years, mission agencies such as the USGS that seek principally to serve public goals rather than to advance science have experienced minimal budgetary growth, in some cases not even keeping up with inflation. Since 1996, research funds at the USGS have risen by 16 percent, NOAA 11 percent, EPA 33 percent, NIST 38 percent, CDC 45 percent, um, and even Department of Defense by 60 percent over 15 years. Yet, over the same period, government funding uh, for research has doubled. Most went to NIH, which tripled, um, and the, the rest went to NSF, which doubled. Um, together, these two agencies captured three quarters of all spending increases for federal science. So the idea that the push for useful science is leading to different decisions, um, we're not there yet. Um, it would be great if we could say, yeah, all this useful stuff has led to NOAA's budget going up by a factor of five, and it's time to give those poor guys at NIH and NSF, throw them a bone. Um, so th the point is that in principle, I agree with you, particularly when it comes to the university environment and so on, but when mm -hmm. it comes to the world of science policy, um, the stuff that science has justified in terms of helping society, actually, we haven't seen those numbers turn around to support that kind of science. Well, uh, yeah, I... And I'll put a question mark at the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, as, as I said, Roger, I've learned to, to appreciate exactly what you said, learn from Dan, too. Uh, and I'm, this was intentionally meant to be a little uh, provocative, although it also is an attempt to reflect on my own experience and what I've tried to learn to do in teaching my own science policy class. I'm teaching a science and technology policy graduate seminar right now at, at CU Boulder, I mean at um, CSM. And uh, one thing I tried to do this semester is create a, a <laughs> tension between what I call up in the clouds, airy fairy theory, and down in the weeds, uh, really getting your hands dirty, learning what's going on. So we're reading the, uh, this new book, uh, science of Science Policy, and um, trying to, to talk about the, the concrete on-the-ground problems of making science useful, and I've created a, they, they read this, the usable science pamphlet as well. But at the same time, every class we're reading a little bit more of Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition. And because Arendt tries to put in broad historical philosophical perspective what's happened to the world as the result of the development of modern science. And it's really transformed our way of being in the world. We think in terms of making our decisions now with science in ways that we never thought before. And I think it's helpful to try to pull out of the, of the weeds and look at from a, a little bit of a 40,000 feet level what's been happening so that then we can go back and really act more intelligently uh, with usable science. The, the other thing that, that I, I guess I'm disturbed about is this demand from students, and this is more, this is not in the policy area. This is sort of more on the ground with, with students. There's so much a demand from students that I've got to make it relevant to them rather than they need to do some work to utilize what's offered in the classroom to make it relevant to them. And I get a little bit of that within the culture as a whole, in our political discussions. I, I'm, I'm, I'm awed by what Shannon does. Uh, I mean, I think that's, that's incredibly uh, wonderful, working with people on the, the Western Slope or in, uh, in Alaska. I mean, I, I would love to be able to do that kind of thing. You're, I'm sure you're right. It's very labor-intensive. Um, 
and by the kinds of things that, uh, that Susan is leading at, at uh, Woods Hole. Um, at the same time, I wish that our culture as a whole would present the person who said, I'm a little, uh, I'm little, little, little redneck here, we don't believe this stuff. Pressure on them, don't just assert yourself, learn from other people. I mean, this, this stuff that we're getting in the political realm right now about, you know, we don't want to turn America into France or Europe. We don't want to Europeanize it. It's just nonsense. People don't know anything about Europe who are complaining about this. <laughs> uh, France has the best medical system in the world. They spend half on what we, of what we spend on health care and that they have better outcomes. And we don't want to be like France? Why not? <laughs> uh, so. Yes, yeah, Susan. Go ahead. Um, if I could respond to, to Roger's question as well. Um, inherent in your uh, comment was that these two agencies, the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, are the premier institutions that support unfettered research. Uh, they are, their mission, in, in, in inferred by your comment, was that um, they have no uh, sort of purpose other than to create knowledge. Um, and I think, I think you have to, it is true that both the NSF and NIH do uh, support a lot of, of what we would call discovery-based or fundamental or, you know, the basic inquiry that, 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 that Carl was talking about. But if you look at the trends of that funding and the earmarking of that funding, you will find that it's being drained from that core unfettered research into programs that are much more user, user or usability oriented, okay? So things in the NSF like uh, the uh, National Robotics Initiative or the, in NSF the Advanced Manufacturing uh, Research Agenda or the Sustainability Research Agenda. They are all primarily prioritizing, if you will, the science, and I understand the need for it because there's an awful lot of science that we could be doing, but we don't have all the money to do it, okay? So they, in a sense, are prioritizing the science, or at least part of that science budget, on, on issues that have much more, at least a, a pathway of sight to um, a usability uh, a framework. NIH did a lot of taking money from the R01 budget, which is the unfettered discovery budget, and putting some of that into a translational research um, budget line. So I think it has to be tempered um, a little bit that, it's, that, that those budgets, though, although they may have increased, they certainly haven't just ultimately all gone to this unfettered discovery Vanderbush uh, model. Absolutely. Yes, and I guess my, my point is, is that how you choose to be useful can take on very different models. I think we saw really a very, very good example of the stakeholder engagement model and the two-way learning process, all very, very important. But I think Sh Shannon brings out a very, very important point. Um, and this is true for you know, working with any stakeholder groups. It is expensive. So do not deny yourself that it does cost money to, for, to put that, that engagement process together. And, it, it, and you can't have a scientist doing this pro bono, okay? They really do. It really does have to be funded. And there has to be a realization of that. And unfortunately, a lot of the funding agencies don't necessarily appreciate that right now. If, if, yeah. <laughs> um, if, if I can just uh, sort of ask a question or, or, or maybe make a comment, is that uh, at times, Carl, I hear you sort of um, uh, advancing this thought of the deficit model of, of science that uh, one element of a healthy democracy um, is for the populace to uh, you know, learn more from science, be curious, uh, 
uh, without regard for practical outcomes, uh, and that that in itself is a virtue. Um, but I think it's also maybe important to, to, to uh, see a little bit uh, clearer uh, separation between what's happen happening culturally and what's happening scientifically, because what we're also seeing um, in uh, Shannon's example in particular, um, but also um, with some of Susan's uh, research examples, is that um, the tables get turned at some point, and society actually feeds knowledge and information back to science, which I don't think uh, was, was happening in to Tocqueville's days, and I think he came from a pretty elitist uh, position as well, right? He, I'm sure he would have advanced the whole sort of uh, 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 linear model of, of science. But I was just wondering um, if the three of you might be able to, to comment a little bit about that and, um, you know, the nature of the sort of, uh, as we heard earlier today from, from uh, Jason about, you know, expertise um, and if that role changes and does that, you know, change the relationship between science and democracy? Just, just quickly, I would say to, uh, that there's a difference between um, the deficit model of, of science in saying that, well, people just have to learn science, that doesn't mean you let them get away with not being intelligent. So much of the problem, it seems to me, is that there's, there is intelligence without science, but there's also, but all non-science doesn't mean it's intelligent. Not all local knowledge, not all indigenous knowledge is intelligent. Uh, a lot of it is superstition. Mm -hmm. um, there is some intelligence, there is some real knowledge there, but we ought to be careful to sort of too quickly say, well, you know, uh, bow down at the, uh, the altar of uh, local knowledge. It's not all intelligent. I some of it is, and we need to learn from it. I agree, and uh, you know, I, I, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. I mean, on, on all parts of the spectrum, science, local knowledge, whatever. Um, to kind of answer your question, you know, I think, especially when it comes to climate skepticism <coughs> and the stakeholders that I talked about who talk about being rednecks, you have to remember that so much of how, s how scientific issues are negotiated are fundamentally embedded in political processes that have high stakes. And a lot of the people that I talked to that were climate skeptics, it was very interesting how when it wasn't this sort of public platform like the Basin Roundtable, for example, um, or other issues where they've got state or federal regulatory, um, you know, either mandates or representatives coming and presenting whatever it is, whether it's climate science, whether it's ecological modeling, whatever it is. Um, that have big stakes attached to it, but when I would talk to them, either off the record or even a lot of times in the interviews, the dialogue would shift. And a lot of them would, you know, give credence to the fact that, yeah, I, I you know, I've been, I'm an agriculturalist, I'm a rancher, whatever it is, I've been on this landscape for 30, 40, 50 years, I see the changes, I know it's changing. Whether or not it's Al Gore, a lot of times they said, Al, you know, that Al Gore science. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. And, and, and they'd be a lot more honest that their skepticism came from actually a very informed place. Um, and, and, you know, and I think part of the trust building that happened between us is I would admit, yeah, there's a lot of problems, you know, channeling Pilkey over here. Um, there's a lot of problems with the IPCC process. There's a lot of problems with climate modeling. There's a lot of problems with all science. But that doesn't negate the importance of the issue and the fact that it is happening, you know, and, and it is, there is a human role. And it, it just, it would completely shift the debate. So it wasn't necessarily that they were coming from a place of ignorance, because what I found was they were, a lot of them were really, really smart about this stuff. And one of the things that I find fascinating about the Basin Roundtable process is how sophisticated their understanding is getting through this process of really getting bombarded with a lot of scientific information and, and having to synthesize it and understand it. And it's actually quite impressive. But that's, that's different than when, when climate science or water science or ecology science or whatever it is, 
um, is embedded in politics and is and and yeah a lot of what on the surface seems to be ignorant perspectives come out because there are these high stakes like as I mentioned the big translucent diversions people coming to take their water um, that's going to have local and regional ecological effects social and ecological effects um, another big issue that was going on out there when I was doing my field work was House Bill 1365 which was the the bill to transition the front range um, coal-fired power plants to natural gas and we're this is a very very fundamentally coal culture out there and you know they had really good arguments about why House Bill 1365 was hugely problematic, not least of which was the process by which it happened. But even the science, you know, that we still don't have a good understanding. We're getting there, but we don't have a good understanding of the life cycle of coal versus the life cycle of natural gas. And they're right. So, you know, you really have to, that's why I stress this importance of understanding the political context, the regulatory context, and actually how interesting it is when you take people out of that and they're out of their political positioning and the different kind of dialogue that you can have. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll just add another sort of perspective on your question here, and, and that is certainly the, the types of research questions that one is addressing have certainly evolved over the 150 years or, or whatever. I mean, this is, uh, you know, a, a lot of science, particularly the um, associated with environmental issues, is, is basically going, to, going towards a problem-oriented framework. And, and that does require a different way of, of doing science. If, if you look at the tenure cases that I have at my institution, in fact, uh, I think it's probably true at many academic institutions, you, you rarely see the single-authored publication anymore. You rarely, you see, you know, high energy physics did this a long time ago. You know, they have hundreds of people on their, on their publications. But you're seeing more and more of a, a natural collaborative environment that's really, really required in order to tackle some of these outstanding scientific questions, particularly in something as complex as the environment. So, so I, I do think that, that that probably is a nuance to just what was what, what Carl was talking about in terms of how, how, how science has changed, how science has evolved. It's, and it's evolved in the sense not of, not of the hypothesis-driven evidence effort, but it's evolved in terms of what you can do as just an individual versus what you have to do and how, what collaborations. And that's collaborations with stakeholders, it's collaborations with the private sector, it's collaborations disciplinary and scientifically which does put a very, very interesting strain on sort of what you reward in your institutions. Um, and I think that, that the real question is, is will the universities, will the academic institutions evolve their reward system in order to really appreciate that evolution um, in the discipline? Um, hi, thank you guys. I really love this panel. It's been really interesting, and I appreciate what you're saying. I wanted to, uh, at the risk of beating a dead horse here, uh, try and rephrase a question and get your response to it, which is we've talked a lot about you know, the utility of research and that scientists, by and large, everyone thinks they're doing useful work. My question for you guys is, particularly in the domains that you are most aware of, who decides what's useful? And then secondly, who should decide what's useful? Yeah, I'll talk about the Alaska case because I think that is a, a really good illustration of that, that exact question, which is the regulatory issue that was at stake in terms of the fall moose hunt was um, whether or not climate change was playing a role in shifting seasonality that was making the moose go into rut later and was shifting it outside of the regulatory window that the tribes were able to harvest. And so the, in other words, the seasonality was kind of shifting, but the regulatory window was staying the same. So you had this time period where um, they were actually hunting illegally, but we're talking about you know winter food security for, for villages, for households and communities. The, the 
regulatory system in, in Alaska is, is pretty Byzantine. It's a dual state federal regulatory system for subsistence and wildlife management. But the state has the ultimate authority. Um, and the, the decisions were being made in these board of game meetings. Um, now, the, the kind of different stakeholder groups that would, that would appear in these board of game meetings where you had the tribes um, who were given, you know, kind of this, you know, surface level ability to sort of state their case at the beginning of the meeting. You had the biologists who worked for the state and federal agencies, and then you had the, the actual board of game who were made up of, shall we say, Sarah Palin's friends, primarily. Um, so these are people who are commercial, um, they're either commercial, they have commercial hunting businesses, or they're, they're big oil and gas people. They, ha they have a fundamental stake to not believe climate change is real. And so the way that decisions would get made were that they'd give the tribes their little time to talk, and then the discussion would really happen between the biologists and the board of game. And as these discussions were happening, the tribes had no chance to then re-enter into the discussion. And that is important. You know, these processes of how, not just who's making decisions, but how they're made, and whether or not people, stakeholders, people who really have a stake, are able to participate at the same level and have the same influence as the people who ultimately make the regulations. So that's just one example, and that was a big part of what my, my doctoral work was looking at, was how this was kind of playing out in terms of um, who said what science was right or usable. <laughs> so, well, th this is the same, it's another statement of what Susan said, uh, you know, who defines the research questions and, and how is it going to be used, right? Mm -hmm. that, and there's two versions of that question. One is an empirical version, what, what is going on? And another is the question of, okay, how should it go on? Um, and I think both are pretty complicated. Uh, I don't think there's any simple answer. I mean, I do agree with, with Roger that in a, in a democracy we have the, people have the right to make stupid decisions. Uh, and we should, we should make sure that they can exercise that right. But at, at the same time, I would, I would like to figure out some way, this is on a, a normative basis, to say that, well, people who, who are going to exercise that right have to try to work to do it intelligently. Uh, I don't know how you do that, and I don't know how you implement that. I don't know how you operationalize it. Um, it's more true, it's, it's easier to think about in terms of medicine, uh, because if people, if people do have the right to uh, deny treatment for something that they need treatment for, Steve Jobs did it, he died as a result, uh, and but it's a, it's, it's a local result, and then other people, family and friends, can see the results, and maybe they'll make a different kind of decision when they get uh, cancer. Um, it's harder to think about how you do that at the level of environmental uh, decision making or water resource planning. Um, I, I don't have an answer to the basic question. I, I really like what Susan did at the beginning of talking about all the different versions of usability, and there needs to be some real work on sort of parsing these out. What does usable mean in all these different contexts? And that's, that's where I think academics could contribute, because one way of beginning to answer your question is to talk about, okay, what can usable, usability mean in different contexts? I'll try to be short then. Listening to this conversation has made me think of uh, Tom Guerin's work on cultural boundaries of science um, and looking at the history of science as looking at how scientists construct boundaries around their work um, for their own advantage and in particular cultural context. And I'm just thinking about how the, the terms usable science and pure science and curiosity-driven science are, are feel to me a little problematic and I think that's called out by Roger's comment that no one advocates for useless science. Well, of course not. Um, and so I, I guess my question might be, and this may be just provocative, but 
what if there really isn't much difference between the way science is happening now when people are trying to do usable science and the science that many, many years ago people said was pure science or basic research or curiosity driven? What, how might we measure whether the science that's being done now is any more usable or useful than the science that was, con was produced under a kind of regime of pure science or basic research? Just a, a little bit of a follow-on that I was really struck when people were talking about useful science about the issue of trust that kept coming up in Shannon's piece. Um, I had the chance to be at a, a, a roundtable type thing in another state on a, a controversy over whether or not the community should accept a big wind farm. And what citizens kept saying over and over again was we need objective information about uh, the effects of this wind farm. They just kept using that word. And all my STS training just sort of all my alarm bells are going, oh my God, these people don't realize objectivity is a lot, you know, there's a thousand critiques of objectivity. But what I think it really boiled down to is they simply didn't trust the sources they were getting. So a very large, a very large <laughs> utility had gone into their community, slapped down a huge proposal for a giant wind farm, treated them in a very ham-fisted manner, and they just didn't trust them, no matter what they were saying. Mm -hmm. um, and they were looking for some kind of, s some source of knowledge that they could trust, which would make it useful to them to know whether, and, and they were split as to whether or not they should, they, they, they were not of one mind as to whether or not to accept this big wind farm. It was a community in economic decline and meant a lot of money. Um, and in a way, I, th this is my interpretation, what they would trust was something that wasn't immediately useful. That is, they would trust knowledge coming from a source that didn't have a vested interest. Mm -hmm. And that that is what sort of makes science useful in a lot of these political contexts. Um, trust, trust is, if, if, you, if you go through a lot of these things, trust is an issue. Um, and it, it is one of the reasons why um, I'm so interested in protecting uh, the scientific integrity, integrity and the deliberative process of science. Uh, because what a scientist has is his or her scientific integrity and his or her reputation. And the ability to go and interact with any number of groups of people where you are basically independent, you have a neutral, as much neutral position as possible, okay, but you present yourself that way is, is, is really, really critical. And what you see in terms of all of these examples where uh, there's been success is when the scientist sticks to that, develops that trust, and by the way, doesn't advocate for a particular solution, okay? Where scientists get into trouble is when they go in to an environment of any kind and say, advocate for this particular solution. So in your, in your case of this uh, uh, wind farm, uh, you know, it basically they were striving for some sort of independent, credible, evidence-based approach and information that's, that's, that's going to be, that's gonna help them make a decision because deep down, gut-wise, there was too much on the table in terms of economic benefit to somebody or some entity. So I think, I think that's really important and a, a very important uh, thing. If I were, I, I, I don't have time to talk about, Jason, we could talk offline about that, but if I were to have one comment that I would leave with, and this leads to it very, very nicely. This is September 27th, 2012. Does anyone know what happened 50 years ago on this date? It was the publication of Silent String by Rachel Carson. Now, the people will say that she was incredible in terms of, of being able to raise awareness on environmental issues, that it was her work that eventually founded the EPA, and it's certainly her work in terms of gr growing awareness. But I would argue that the success of her legacy was the fact that she first and foremost was a scientist 
who really grounded all of her arguments in a very neutral way in science. And that scientific foundation is what I think is really, really critical as we go forward in many of these issues that we're planet and humanity is facing. 50 years to this date, publication of science fiction. Yeah, I mean, I think what your, what your point elucidates is that we have a sort of, I think, shared assumption in this room that usable science is necessarily a good thing. And there's a lot of science that's used for bad things and a lot of science that's used to justify power dynamics, right? And, and that's the thing that I've observed in my work and that you hit on and that the, you know, the folks in the Ample White Basin are worried about, um, not just for House Bill 1365, but for a whole host of issues that the tribes deal with. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the, the reality is that a lot of science comes at communities through either um, regulators or through special interests, right? And a lot of times it's used to control and to have power. And, and so that I think is what I'm hearing from your story and what I've heard from the stories that I've participated in, was, which is, you know, we need people who can do science to present us information that isn't packaged in this political sort of interest or power interest. Rachel Carson, I think, you could be argued, was also effective not only because she grounded her argument in science, but because she was known for her appreciation of the wonder of the world through science. Nobody would have read Silent Spring. It would not have been serialized in The New Yorker. It was uh, in June, uh, earlier in The New Yorker. If she hadn't have also written The Sea Around Us and At the Edge of the Sea, which are remarkable books in using science for not useful reasons. It would not have satisfied the criteria of usable science. It was simply looking at the world through science and experiencing its wonder. And I think that that's in part the basis of one, one of the reasons people trusted her, uh, because they saw that she wasn't just interested in making a buck. She didn't make a lot of money out of that, that book. She died shortly thereafter. Um, and so that leads me to, to respond to Jason's desire for, okay, what's the difference? How can we distinguish between usable and non-usable science? Is this just a, a, a distinction without a difference? Or can we make any, what can we do? I don't know whether this is right. I, I'm, I'm at the edge of Seems like every time I think to talk out loud, I, I'm <laughs> seeing the edge of what I really know. Um, but <laughs> at least with the with regard to students, it's the, the student who comes to to me to complain about what's going on in class and is not concerned about a grade. I take more seriously uh, the students who are just wanting to they're grade grubbers. That's a that's a real different story, and I think there's. We get that in, in scientists, too. Some are just, they want prestige, they want power, they want money, they want another grant. Um, and somehow maybe we could at least have some kind of disaggregation on the basis of the, the psychology of the person who's pursuing it. Uh, I, I don't really know Shannon, but just on the basis of the way she described what she's doing, I would describe, I mean, even though it's very usable science, it just struck me that she's really interested in it for not making money and not not usable science reasons. <laughs> uh, that money that, it, the that it, <laughs> she expresses the wonder of what she's doing, even though it's very usable. Um, in in sort of a it's it's not contaminated by just wanting to make it useful. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>